If we can all please rise to do a quick prayer. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Out of the night our spirit awakes at dawn unto you, our God, for your commandments are a light. Teach us your righteousness, your commandments, and your statutes, O God. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding, lest at any time we sleep unto death and sins. Dispel all darkness from our hearts. Graciously give unto us the Son of Righteousness, and by your Holy Spirit preserve our life unassailed. Guide our steps into the way of peace. Grant us to behold the dawn and the day with joy, that we may raise our morning prayers to you. For yours is the might, and yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Please be seated. Before we start on our theme for today, the second uh, adult education program session, we, had a, we have a leftover question from last time. Was the question that I received was, uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, what was he working off of? What liturgy was he basing his own liturgy off of? So I did some research. St. Basil's liturgy was written just before the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. So St. John had St. Basil's liturgy to work off of, which is why they're very similar. Now, where, did Saint, where was St. Basil's liturgy based off of? There's many ancient texts that he draws from, but the most uh, important one and significant one is uh, the liturgy that is written by St. Justin Martyr, or that's included, not written by, but included by St. Justin Martyr, who goes all the way back to the first century A.D., in some of his writings that he left for us, there is a skeleton, basically a skeleton of the divine liturgy as we see it today, that St. Basil and St. John Chrysostom both used in their, as their basis and their skeleton for the divine liturgies that we have today. So that was what I was able to find uh, just to finish off that last um, question that we had from, uh, from our last session. So if we were going to do a quick recap for all those of you that were here for session one, what would kind of have been the main, basically the main point I was making, trying to make, that we were trying to make, really, from the first session? Those of you that were, I know it was about a month ago now, maybe even, it was more than a month ago. But for those of you that were here, anything that you can remember that stuck out to you about the last time that we met? Anything at all? If you had to pick just one, what would it be? You guys being shy today? Yes. <laughs> So the main point that we talked about, that we discussed about, was the divine liturgy as heaven on earth, right? We talked about heaven on earth. And how when we step into our churches, we're stepping into heaven itself, particularly in the divine liturgy, especially in the divine liturgy. We told some nice stories, and then we talked about how when we're in church, we're surrounded by the saints, the angels, by even the departed loved ones that we have lost in this life. And then finally by the Theotokos and by even Christ himself, who really is the one who presides over the liturgy. He's really the one that performs the liturgy, as the priest really doesn't have any powers besides the, what he has through Christ himself. So that was kind of what we talked about last week. That was the main gist of it. Obviously, we, we talked a lot deeper about it. But those were the main points. So today we're going to build on that theme, heaven on earth. But instead of taking a uh, theoretical approach, which was kind of what we did last time, a theological approach, we're going to uh, see how this theology of ours, of the heaven on earth, is expressed in our worship services, in our divine worship, especially the liturgy. The two specific things I want to talk to you guys about today are the, the proscomidi service, which is the preparation of the holy gifts, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit at the end about church architecture, because I believe that's a very important part of our churches that we often don't think about. But really, it expresses that theology that I'm, I'm talking about. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. I have some handouts for you. Don't worry, it's not homework. Uh, just some informational things. You can pass those back. Pass those back. Make sure everybody gets one. Might have to share. I think we'll have enough, though. 
Do we need more in the back? Need some more? I think we got that side covered. Okay, we're good? All right. So the proskomidi service, or the service of the preparation, is done by the priest even before the liturgy starts. It's done usually during the orthros portion, the morning prayers, the morning service. And uh, it's basically the service where the priest takes the prosoro, takes the bread, which I have here, and I, left, I brought one here. He takes the prosoro, and he cuts it. He cuts it into all of the pieces that he's going to need in order to perform the divine liturgy. So this bread, the prosoro, becomes uh, prepared for, to become the body and blood of Christ through this service. And it really illustrates perfectly this theme that we're talking about of heaven on earth and being surrounded by the saints and the angels and even Christ himself. So the prosphoron, as we know, if you go to the prosphoron side of your, of your handout, is the holy bread. The word prosphoron, of course, in Greek means what? Offering. An offering, yeah. It's a bread that we usually make at home, that we seal with the seal that you see in front of you, and then we offer it to the church. We offer it to Christ. And it's part of our synergy, synergy with Christ. If you think about it, really, there's like a, it's a, the whole liturgy is really a synergy. We get, how do we make the bread? Well, we have to have wheat first. The wheat comes from God, you know. Man didn't create wheat out of nothing. Man obtained, he received grain and wheat and all those things from God himself. We receive that gift, we transform it, we make it into bread, and we give it back to the church. And God takes that gift of ours and transforms it again and makes it into his body and blood and gives it to us transforming us and then we of course have to give transform ourselves and give our lives back to Christ so this is the synergy of the divine liturgy so the prosoro is a very special bread we only use during the divine liturgy it's made with a special seal that has a few different elements so that's this side of the sheet right here and I kind of I highlighted the different elements that I'm going to be talking about so in the center square the yellow square that I have there is the we call it the amno. Amno in Greek means what? Ancient Greek. Amnos. Lamb. It means a lamb. Okay. Now, of course, it's not a real lamb, you know, like, uh, you know, like we eat on Pascha. But we call it the lamb. Why do we call it the lamb? Well, the prophet Isaiah, in his, uh, in his prophecies, refers to the Messiah as the lamb. The lamb that will one day be led to the slaughter, that will remain speechless in front of his uh, executors, and that will be slain for the sins of the people. And of course, Christ fulfills these words through his crucifixion. You can see in this square that it's marked with the symbol of Christ, the ICXC Nika, the Jesus Christos Nika, which is the symbol, of course, of the Christian faith that Constantine saw, St. Constantine, before the great battle when he became the emperor of, Constant of the Roman Empire in Constantinople. So this centerpiece here, when it's cut out, will become the body of Christ, the centerpiece. That's why it's called the Amno, because it will eventually become Christ, who, as we said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, we have also, we see, if you look really closely, there's above and below that yellow square, there's two more squares with the Jesus Christos and Ika. Now, those squares, I was trying, I tried very diligently to, to figure out exactly what purpose those are, because during the liturgy on Sunday, we don't use those squares. My guess is, this is my educated guess, is that in areas where prosphora are few and far between, where a priest does not have, like we do here, 20 prosphora, 10 in the freezer, you know, don't have, they don't have that. Maybe they have one prosphora for a whole week. During Lent, they're able to prepare the pre-sanctified gifts using these other squares on the prosphora, because uh, when we prepare the pre-sanctified here, we use two separate loaves, and we cut the amnos out of both of them. But if you only have one, this you would still be able to prepare the pre-sanctified gifts using these extra squares that are present on the prosphora. Now, if we turn our attention to the blue triangle on your sheet, this there's a triangle here, and there's a few, there's a symbol on it, there's a markings on it, and it looks kind of like a letters. Can we discern what letters we see there? It's two Greek letters. It's actually not an alpha. It's a good guess. It kind of looks like an alpha. There's a, the, the symbol on the top is a theta. 
you can see the, uh, if you look here, it comes down, it makes like a diamond, and then there's a line across the middle. That's a theta. And underneath the theta, if you look, there's a me, there's an M. Okay? Those are the letters for the Virgin Mary. And the, the mi thi is, uh, uh, mi theta is uh, mi tirtheu, yeah. Mi tirtheu. So this triangle represents the Theotokos. And it's marked like, marked, like I said, with the, with the mi and the theta. Now we have on the right side, the red triangles here, we have how many? We have nine triangles, and they're smaller. They're smaller than the, the Panagia's triangles, much smaller. Uh, these triangles represent the order of the saints. The nine, the nine orders of the saints that we commemorate at every liturgy. These orders are the angels are the first one. Then we go down the prophets, the apostles, the hierarchs, the martyrs, the ascetics, the unmercenaries, meaning the healers, St. Cosmas and Damianos and saints like that. Then the eighth one is the saint of the day. Or no, the saint, yeah, the saint of the day. And then the final one is the saint, whoever's liturgy we're doing that day. St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, or St. Gregory the Diologist for the pre-sanctified gifts. So these nine triangles here represent the nine orders of the saints. So as the priest prepares the gifts to be used, he reads the following prayers. Excuse me, give me one second. Okay, he reads, in Greek, etimazu vithlem, make ready, O Bethlehem, for Eden has opened for all. Prepare, O Ephratha, for the tree of life has blossomed forth in the cave from the virgin. For her womb did appear as a spiritual paradise in which is planted the divine plant, where of eating we shall live and not die as Adam. Christ shall be born, raising the image that fell of old. And then the next prayer is, You have redeemed us from the curse of the law. By, the, by your precious blood, nailed to the cross and pierced by the spear, you have poured forth immortality upon mankind, our Savior, Glory to you. So these prayers kind of show us that we're preparing the gifts that are going to be for our salvation. That they're going to be for us, the, our salvation and our everlasting life. So those are the first prayers of the Proskomidi. And then the priest begins to cut. <clears throat> As he cuts out the Amno, the Amno is the first piece that gets cut out, the yellow square. He cuts along the left side, saying, As a sheep led to the slaughter. Now these are the, it's quoting the words of Isaiah the prophet. Okay. As a sheep led to the slaughter, and he begins to cut it out. Notice how the prayers are about lambs, they're about sheep. And then as he cuts along the right side, he says, And as a blameless lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Meaning, as a blameless lamb that, as it's being sheared, the wool is being cut off, does not speak to, its, to the shearer, he does not open his mouth. And in the Bible, we hear that Christ... In, the, in Pilate's court, did not respond to his questions. He was silent in the face of the, of the uh, accusations. Cutting across the top, he says, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. And along the bottom, he says, who can describe his generation? So now at this point, the priest has cut out the four sides, okay? And it's ready to be removed and lifted out of the prosphoro. And then he says, for his life is taken up from the earth. So the Amno now is taken up out of the prosphoro and is uh, cut on the bottom. We cut the crust off of the bottom because it would be too difficult to cut through. And then we cross it. We cut a cross into the bottom of it so that we can break it later on. And it's placed on the center of the discarion. The discarion, I have a little diagram on the other side here. And this is the placement of the gifts on the discarion. The discarion, the pattern, is this. I have these up here so we can see them a little bit later. This is the discarium. These are where the gifts are placed uh, at, during the liturgy, and then uh, they're consecrated on, on these gifts as well. So it's placed in the center, as you can see on the diagram. And this represents Christ. Christ, of course, is the largest piece. He's in the middle because he is the center of everything that we do. And he is the center of our salvation. So after this piece is cut and placed, the priest fills the chalice, uh, reading more prayers with, with uh, wine and water. And then he begins to cut out the other pieces. For the Theotokos, he says, He says, of, In honor and memory of our most blessed and glorious Lady, the Theotokos and ever-Virgin Mary, through whose intercessions do you accept, O Lord, this sacrifice upon your most heavenly and ideal altar. And as he places them, as he places this piece on the discarion to the left of the Amno, he says, The queen stood at your right hand clothed in a robe of gold adorned in varied colors. 
So this is the, he says that as he places the piece of the Theotokos here, okay, on the, on the discadio. So now we have Christ in the center, and on the side of Christ we have the Theotokos. Kind of like, if we see our iconostasis, we have Christ and we have the Panagia. They're always next to each other. Then very carefully, because the pieces are much smaller, he begins to cut out for each saint. And there's prayers for each order of the saints. So like I said, the, the angels, the prophets, the apostles, all the saints, one by one, he cuts out these little triangles. And he places them on the other side of the Amno, of the Lamb. And they're placed on the, on the Discadium. So as, now as the prayers of preparation are being completed, the Discadium is being filled. It's being filled so far with Christ, with the Theotokos, and with all of the saints. Now the interesting thing is what happens next in terms of our theme. Once all of these things are cut and placed onto the Discadion, the priest then commemorates all of the souls of the living. So the people in his church, the people in his family, uh, anyone that is sick, anyone that needs special prayers, he commemorates them and he takes a small piece, I'll show you the one I use today. He takes a small piece of the prosphoro and underneath he begins to cut little crumbs out of it. Okay? And he cuts the crumbs in one direction, the up and down direction is for the living, and those go on the discarion. And the side to side direction, the horizontal line is for the dead. And so you make a little cross on the bottom of it. And so these are also placed on the discarion underneath, which you can see here on the bottom. So now what do we have? What are we looking at here? We have Christ in the center, surrounded by the Theotokos, the angels and the saints, the living, and the dead which is exactly what we talked about last week as the image of the Divine Liturgy. Not the image, but the reality of the Divine Liturgy. That when we're in church, we're all together with Christ, with the Theotokos, with the saints, with all of the departed, and with our own people that are living on this earth. And so the Proskomidi fulfills this image of the church, the fullness of the church, and of heaven itself. Later in the service, as these gifts have been presented, they've been brought out during the Great Entrance, uh, we, the priest lifts them up. And remember last month we talked about how we are lifted into heaven itself. Okay? Our gifts are lifted into heaven and are offered at the altar table of Christ in heaven. So our gifts, our church basically, is on this discadium, the, the representation of our church, and it's lifted by the priest physically, and at that point the gifts are consecrated. Christ and the Holy Spirit take those gifts up into heaven, and they become the body and blood of Christ. So the Amno becomes the body and blood of Christ, and we are all then in the presence of Christ, both mystically and uh, in, the, in terms of the Proskomidi as well. So this is the, uh, that was the Proskomidi service. I thought it's a, it's a service that not a lot of people get to see because it's done in the altar behind the closed screen. Uh, usually the priest is here. Usually when I do it here, I'm by myself. So nobody really sees me do it, except for maybe Kiriyani, who's here from very early in the morning. So maybe he will be here for part of it. But no one really sees this service done. And it's really a, a beautiful symbolism of the fullness of the church and what we're doing here. We're uniting ourselves with Christ. We're uniting ourselves with our fellow people, with the Theotokos, with the saints, and with all of those who have departed and all of those who are living. So this was the first thing I wanted to touch on today, the first expression. And we'll see a lot, all the tools that we use during the liturgy. You'll have a chance to see at the end, so you'll be able to see a little more closely um, what I'm talking about with some of these uh, items as well. Now, I need to get the projector set up for the second portion of my talk today. So give me one second here. Yes. Are there any questions about the Proskomidi service? Hold on, John. Let me give you my microphone. You said on the bottom cut, uh, yes. who can describe their generation? Can you yes, elaborate who can on describe that? describe his generation, meaning who can explain how Christ became a man, basically. And, okay. you know, and why he came to earth for us to be sacrificed as a lamb. So, yes. Yeah, you said during the Proskomidi, the priest puts the wine and the water in the yes. chalice? Mm -hmm as well as afterwards, later in the liturgy, he puts the, the warm water. Yes, the question, in case you didn't hear, was the, 
And the proskomidi, the priest, does, places the wine and the water in the chalice, which is true. He does place the wine and the water in the chalice. And later on, he puts hot water in the chalice as well. Um, the reason for that is uh, the priest reads the prayer during the proskomidi and says, uh, By the soldier was Christ pierced with the spear, and out of his side came blood and water. So in the chalice, there's always wine and water. It's not just wine. And uh, we would never use just water. Actually, that was one of the heres ancient heresies, was there were churches that would only use water for Holy Communion and would not use wine. Um, but this isn't a false, this was a false teaching that the church was able to overcome. So even from the beginning, the chalice always has uh, the blood, uh, the, the wine and the water to show Christ's two natures. Both the, the, the wine being the blood, the humanity, and the water being the purity of his divinity. Later on, the hot water is added uh, as a symbol of the fervor of the saints, of the, of the life in Christ, the zeal that we must have for Christ, as well as um, to make the communion easier to consume, easier to, uh, more pleasant to, for the priest to consume later on in the service. So that's why the hot water is also used practically and um, symbolically. Yes, is there another question? Yes, I think uh, yes, okay, so um, what we do, if we don't need, uh, sorry, give us one second. If, you, if, the, if there's only one, uh, if the prospero is only being used for one service, if the prospero is only being used for one service, the bottom square, this piece is removed prior to the amno to get it out of the way, to make it easy for the priest to take the amno out. At that point, he cuts this piece in half, okay? That's this that I showed you. You can see on the top is the Jesus Christos Nika. So that's that bottom square. I cut it in half, as you can see. It's not a full square. And I cut it out from the bottom. It's little crumbs. You make little crumbs from the bottom. As you say each name, you make a crumb, basically. So that's where those pieces come from, and then they are placed on the discarion as well. In some traditions, they're cut out of the side of the proskuro. But the Greek tradition does not do that. It would, take, it would be very difficult to, to perform the service uh, that way. Yes? You say the name. Yes. What names do you say during um, that? I, so the priest will say the names from his family usually first. Um, if he has an immediate, like his own family, present that as kids. And then he'll say his, his own personal uh, family names. And then any names of his parishioners that are, uh, uh, that he commemorates, uh, that he's able to commemorate. Obviously in a small church, you could even commemorate every parishioner. In large churches such as ours, we don't commemorate all of them. Down here, for example, I commemorate all the Sunday school children. I read all the names of the Sunday school kids, and then and they're for their families. And then uh, any names that are given to the priest. Some families, when they bring in proskura, will give names. So they will give names to be read during the proskomidi service. So this is where the names that are read uh, at that time. So, and it's a wonderful thing to do if you ever bring a proskura, or if, even if you just want your names to be read, please bring them, and we'd be happy to read them at the proskomidi to. Uh, pray for you. It's a blessing to have, and so it's a wonderful thing to do as well. Okay. Um, yes. Question. The hot water isn't isn't it also symbolic of the water that came out of Christ's side when they? Well, that that prayer is read at the beginning when the wine and the water are placed in the beginning. When he says that the spear of the soldier, uh, the his side was pierced with the soldier's spear, and out came water and uh, wine and, or blood and water. So that's more towards the beginning of the service. Is that symbolism? Uh, the question was, uh, if you have two or three thousand names, do you read all of them? Uh, you do your best as the priest uh, in modern day liturgies. Uh, we only have a short, really, amount of time. Even if you do the proskomidi during the orthros, you only have about 20 or 30 minutes to really to read names. And it's, it's impossible to read three thousand names. There was a saint, though, I will say this. There was a saint in 20th century Greece. His name was St. Nicholas Planas. And St. Nicholas Planas served liturgy every day for 50 years. Okay? And during his liturgies, he would commemorate, uh, he always had with him the names that he was going to commemorate. He always kept them on him. They called him his contract. He called them his contracts. So he would keep these big stacks of names. And um, he would read every single name during the Orthodox service. Uh, it would take him hours, hours to read every name. He would not finish liturgy until um, about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, mostly from the reading of names of the, those that he commemorated. So... If we were to be perfect, we would uh, read every name. Um, you know, we, are, we have to do, a, you know, there is a practicality sake as well um, that we have to be mindful of. So we read as many as we can. I always read every name that I have here because we don't have 
2,000 names. I have a few, uh, probably a few hundred names, so it's easy to read in a few minutes. And so we do our best. So that's, the, that's my full answer to that question. Okay, now switching from the uh, Proscomidi service to the church architecture, which I feel is extremely important to our uh, theology. It's really, if you think about it, the church architecture is the first impression that we have of any church that we walk into. When we go, into, when we go to a church that we're not members of or not familiar with, um, it's the, the first thing we notice is how the church looks from the outside and then when we walk in from the inside. We look around to see, oh, do they have the same thing that my church has? Oh, do, do they have this? Oh, that's really nice. Oh, I don't, usually we say, oh, I don't like that so much, okay? Um, so the first impression we have of the church is how it looks. So it's a very important part of our worship and it's a very important part of our expression of our theology, especially of um, this concept of heaven on earth. So to start out, I wanted to tell uh, a great story uh, from our church history. In the 10th century, uh, Prince Vladimir of Russia, uh, Russia was still pagan at the time. It had not accepted any form of organized religion except for paganism. And during this time, Prince Vladimir uh, was deciding what faith he wanted to follow. And he got offers basically from four groups, from the Jews, from the Muslims, from the Western Christians or the Catholics, and from the Orthodox. And so he sent people out to see each of these religions, to kind of see what they were all about. Like, okay, let's, I don't know anything about these faiths, I'm going to send some people out so they can report back to me and we can make a decision. So uh, when they returned, when they returned to Russia one by one, first the Jews came and reported that the Jews, uh, for everything, for all the wonderful things of their faith, they had lost Jerusalem to the Muslims. And, Saint, and Prince Vladimir, being a very uh, uh, administratively minded king and prince, said, well, if they can't even hold their own jewel city, then God has clearly abandoned them. So I, we're not going to choose the Jews because God is not with them anymore. Then of the Muslims, the emissaries came back and said that there was no gladness. This is the true the true uh, report of the, of the emissaries. He said, there's no gladness among their people, only sorrow. And he said, also the Muslims do not permit eating pork or drinking alcohol. And to that, Prince Vladimir said, drinking is the joy of the Russian people, and we cannot live without this pleasure. <laughs> so Prince Vladimir said, we cannot, we cannot become Muslim. It's not going to work out. <laughs> then the Catholic Church, the emissaries from the Cath that went to the Catholic churches in Germany they went to, came back and said there is no beauty in their churches. So this is interesting because now the shift comes to what were they looking for? They were looking for beauty in their churches and in their worship services. So they came back from the Catholics in Germany and said there's no beauty there. There's nothing, there's nothing beautiful about what they do. And finally, the emissaries from the Orthodox who had gone to Constantinople returned. And they were reported that they were amazed by what they saw. They had witnessed the divine liturgy in all of its fullness taking place in Hagia Sophia, in the great church of Hagia Sophia, back when it was still a church. And the emissaries said, we've never seen such beauty, and we know not how to tell of it. We, knew, we no longer knew whether we were in heaven or on earth. So if you can flip to the next slide. These are pictures of modern day Hagia Sophia. A little bit tough to see. Oh, let me turn the lights off. It might be a little bit easier. So this is modern day Hagia Sophia. Uh, obviously you can see there are uh, some Muslim additions that they've made. So a little background on Hagia Sophia. It was built in the 6th century by the Emperor Justinian. And uh, it was a huge undertaking, but they only built, it only took them about four years to build, which is amazing, really, to think about the technology they had at that time. They built this amazing structure in four years, and that was including the dome collapsing three times. Um, so it's, it's really an amazing, it's an amazing piece of architecture. It really transformed architecture across the world. Uh, and what the, what the, what uh, the Emperor Justinian, who was a faithful uh, Christian, was trying to portray through this church was the majesty of the liturgy. And really that when you go, like we were talking about, when you go into church, you're in, 
in heaven itself. I had the, I had the honor to go a couple of years ago to see Hagia Sophia. And while it is sad that it's not a church anymore, you can really understand the glory and the majesty, not only of Byzantium, but really of the Orthodox worship services that we have. So what are some striking things about this church that we see? Just things that you see right off the top of your head. Yes. The light. Yeah, the light is a big thing. It was a big thing for the, uh, for the Christians at the time, for the Byzantines. What they were trying to do with the light, first of all, Christ is, teaches us that he is the light of the world. And so they wanted to bring in a lot of light. You can see all the windows. They say they have windows everywhere. But most important for them was this ring of windows they had right at the base of the dome. They wanted to make uh, the effect that when the sun was shining through, that the dome was floating. That the dome had no foundation in the church. That it was just kind of, it was there, like heaven itself. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it's not, it's not bound to anything on the earthly level. That it's just on its own in heaven by itself. So light was a big uh, factor for the, for the Byzantines. What else do you find striking ab about the structure? The size is, it's, it's huge, yeah. It fits countless thousands, thousands of people. In the old days, there were 13 services a year where the entire city of Constantinople would have liturgy in Hagia Sophia. The entire city would come to Hagia Sophia to have liturgy with the patriarchs and the bishops uh, and the priests. So, and there's also two levels here, so you can fit, obviously, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It's a huge church. Very good. What else? Anything else? The gold, yes, very beautiful. Uh, they did not spare any uh, expense in making a Sophia. Absolutely. What else? Anything else? Very tall, yes. The, uh, your eye is drawn upwards okay, by the lines. The lines of the architecture draw your eyes upward, which gives you the effect of you're going, moving up towards heaven, okay? moving up towards the dome in heaven. There's another interesting architectural development, which was a first of its kind. You notice that the dome is not supported by any direct uh, beams downwards. The edge of the dome here, there's no beams coming straight down to the ground. This was the first time this had ever been done. And what they did was they built these things called pendentives. And they took the weight of the dome and placed it on the side walls instead of having to add extra, uh, extra beams to support it. And it gives the effect that the church has a weightlessness. That the dome, even though it's huge, the dome is over 100 feet wide that it has no weight because it's just floating. It looks like it's just hanging there by a thread, which is why it caved in three, two times. You know, the third time they got it right, and it's been there for 1,500 years, but it caved in two times um, because it, the architecture was very difficult to perfect, especially at that time. So what makes Hagia Sophia and really every proper, this was an inspiration for many, many Orthodox churches across the world. What makes it so impressive is that through the architecture, through the design, through the beauty that they put into this church, uh, it expresses the theological truth that we've been discussing, that the church is heaven on earth. Uh, so I want to touch on a few things that we find in many Orthodox churches that teach us this point. If you can go to the next slide. Okay, the first basic point I want to talk about is the floor plan. We, many times we don't think about this, but the shape of the church, of the, of the worship space, is actually very important. Our church upstairs also follows this floor plan. Uh, the basic idea is that the shape of the worship space is a cross. That's the red, the red here. It's a cross, okay? In the center of the cross, this is the dome, okay? So the dome is in the center of the cross. And this teaches us through the architecture that in order to reach the dome, which is heaven, it's, it's the, the uh, heaven itself, okay? Uh, in order to reach it, we must pass first through the cross. Circle, the circles, of course, are symbols of eternity. So in order for us to achieve eternity, we must first pass through the cross, the self-denial, the self-emptying uh, that Christ went through in order to uh, resurrect from the dead and to grant us eternal life. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, now the two other things I want to talk to you about, the vertical movement in churches and the horizontal, the west to east movement. So if we look, think about our churches, uh, and again, many of these things we'll even find upstairs, especially in Panagias, um, there's a movement from the floor level up to the dome, which is from earth to heaven. So the, fo the floor level is earth, represents earth. On the, on the floor floor, literally the floor, usually we have red carpet. If you look down at your feet right now, the carpet is red. Any idea why the carpet would be red in an Orthodox church? It's almost always red. I would say like 90% of Orthodox churches, if they have carpet, it's red on the floor. Say it again. 
Divinity, it's a good guess. Royalty, it is a, it's a beautiful color. Yes, what else? Blood, yeah, it is, it is blood. Yeah, the color of blood. The church is built on the blood of the martyrs. Okay, so on the base of the floor is the martyr's blood and Christ's blood himself. Okay, so it represents the earthly struggle that the martyrs had to endure. Remember we said pass through the cross to get to the eternity. The earthly cross that they had to endure, that they had to suffer through in order for us to build the church, okay, in order for the church to survive and for us to be able to experience heaven here on earth. So, this, so we start out now on the bottom and now we move our way up. Go ahead, uh, Chris. We go to the dome. Okay. Uh, if you can go back one, sl one slide actually. Another point I want to make is that uh, on the bottom level, we see many straight lines. So the pews are straight lines. The columns here are straight lines. Even the iconostasis has a lot of straight lines. It's a mix. The iconostasis is a mix, and we'll get to that later. If you go to Panagia's upstairs, you'll see on the bottom floor, there's big columns, and it's many straight lines. What that does, what is a representation is, again, it's a representation of earth. Okay? The straight lines, it's like we're bound by the linear movements, okay? We have some limitations, and it draws our eyes upward. Now, if we look at the upward part of the church, which is the dome, the straight lines are replaced by what? A lot of circles, a lot of circles. We have circle, 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 circles, many circles, okay? So, um, so the straight lines are replaced by circles, and the dome, then, is the representation of heaven, which makes sense, then, that who is in the center of the dome? Christ himself. In most churches, the traditional icon to put in the, in the center of the dome is Christ, the Pantocrator, the one who has all authority. Okay? So Christ is in the center of the dome because he is the one in heaven. He's looking down on us and also he's blessing. Christ in the Pantocrator is always blessing. Because when we walk into a church, the church of course is our hospital. It heals us and we are transformed. So through Christ's blessing, we are transformed. So now our eyes are drawn up to heaven and we see the, tr the, the path that we have to travel. We have to go from earth to heaven. Now if we go one more slide, we have this other th portion of the church which is the altar. If you notice, even in St. Catherine's Chapel down here, the altar is, is what? Is it on the floor level? It's, it's not on the floor level. Is it at the dome level? No. It's elevated, but it's not all the way elevated. It's in between. So the altar then is the meeting point. It is the meeting point of heaven and earth. The earthly priests take their place, and they are met by the heavenly uh, hierarch, which is Christ himself. They are the, you know, the flesh and blood, are the, the bread and the wine, are transformed into the body and blood of Christ in the divine altar. So this altar, again, is the meeting point of heaven and earth. And so through the architecture of the church, even in the different levels that we have, the church is trying to show us that, hey, this is where it happens. This is where heaven and earth come together. This is where we can experience heaven ourselves. Okay, now the next movement I want to show is the west to east. Now in the Orthodox churches, the churches always face east, as long as you're able to do it. They face east because, for a few reasons. First of all, the Bible speaks about Christ returning and coming from the east. Okay? Uh, but another reason is that we call Christ the Son, S-U-N. We call him the Son, S-O-N. But he's also the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness, and he is the never-setting Son. And of course, the Son rises in the east. So the church faces the sun, the rising sun that never sets, who is Jesus Christ, which is why the church faces east. On the west end of the church, in almost every Orthodox church you'll enter, we have the narthex. And again, the narthex is rep a representation of earth. We come, uh, we come here and we still have our earthly anxieties, our earthly weights. We come to light our candles to pray for the things that we need the people that we're praying that we need to pray for but we still have not entered the church proper we still have not entered into heaven because we're still outside in the ancient church the catechumens those who were studying to become christians would sit in the narthex they would not come into the church nowadays we don't make distinctions uh, but they would sit in the narthex and they would actually be not be allowed to stay through the entire service so they would stay here because they had not entered into the fullness of the faith of being baptized. And so they could not experience that heaven yet because they were not ready for it. So the narthex is earth. Now as we move farther east, if we can go to the next slide, we go to the nave. The nave is where we're sitting, where we're standing right now, or sitting right now. It's where usually the pews are. 
An interesting note, the actual Orthodox tradition is not to have any pews. It's to have seats on the sides. Many times in Greece you'll see churches like that. And for people to stand through the whole service, and only if you get tired to go sit down. But in America we've adopted the uh, more Western practices of having pews and chairs. Um, that's a side note. So the nave though, uh, now we're moving from earth, we've moved into the church proper. And the nave uh, comes from the Greek word naos. And it has the same root as the word navy. Navy meaning, what do we think of when we think of navy? Ocean, what else? Ships, good. Okay, so the church then calling itself a naos, okay, a navy, is calling itself a ship. Okay? The ship that holds us all and that carries us through the stormy life that we lead, okay? or the, the stormy world that we live in. And it's taking us then, it's carrying us through all of the, the difficulties that we have in this life, and it's carrying us to uh, heaven itself. So uh, when we think of the church, we have to think of the church as a ship. And there's, on the next slide, there's an interesting icon I found of uh, Christ and his saints and the Theotokos and many hierarchs. And they're in a ship. And it says on the ship, Holy Orthodox Church. Okay? So here's the church as a ship, and it's being sailing away from all of the things that are uh, attacking it. Okay? Uh, and the Antichrist is here. It's a very unique icon. I've only seen it in a few places, so I thought it was interesting just to illustrate this point of the ship and the church being the ship that protects its members from all of the dangers that we have to face in this life. So going through then into the church, now we are in the ship and it's carrying us to our final destination, which again is the, the holy altar, which is heaven itself, okay? which is, the, which is the, uh, heaven, the representation of heaven moving from west to east. So the altar being heaven, of course, is where the liturgy takes place. It is the presence of God in the church, is the Holy of Holies. In the ancient temple of Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies was the part of the temple where nobody could enter. Only the high priest would go in once a year to offer incense. But they could not go in because they believed that the presence of God was there. So it was, blas it was blasphemous and disrespectful for, to, for us to walk, for a person to walk into the Holy of Holies. Now, uh, God has made it much easier for us to access Him. So we're, you know, the priests and the altar servers are able to go into the altar to stand in the presence of God, and that presence of God is brought out to all the people. Um, in the ancient temple, again, there was a separation. You couldn't even see the Holy of Holies. Now the doors are opened. You know, heaven has been opened to us so that we can walk you know, towards it and be enlightened by God and His divine light. Are there any questions then about the church architecture, about the, what we see in our church, uh, how our churches are built, and how it expresses this reality of the heaven on earth? Many times I think we don't really consider it. We just, we, we're used to our, our churches and we walk into it, we say, we don't, we don't think about it too much. But everything that we do in our churches has symbolism. There's nothing that we do just, just because. It, that's easy. You know? Everything we do is uh, to make it beautiful and to show the truth that we are the fullness of the faith that we are the true Christian faith, and that we are, uh, that the Orthodox Church and our churches is heaven itself. Any, are there any questions? Is there any meaning to the other one second. Hold on one second. I just wanted to make sure I understand the direction. Sure. West to east and then south. Right? North to south, north to south uh, is not really, that's more to make the, the uh, representation of the cross, north to south. So we, it's the, and the cross is a representation again of, uh, if we think about it, we have a horizontal line. This is the earth. You know, it goes from east to west, it covers the entire earth. And then you have the vertical line of the cross being uh, from earth to heaven. So through the cross, Christ encompasses all of humanity and also all of creation from earth up to heaven as well. Any other questions? Yes, one second. Father, I've been in a church in Las Vegas yes. that was built the very old, old way with five domes. Mm. Would you please refresh my memory what the five domes were for? Um, Christ is always the center dome. Uh, the big dome is always Christ uh, representing heaven itself. Usually when you see four, uh, we usually put them in our, our on right underneath our domes. Um, usually it's for the uh, evangelists, the four evangelists. Now, I have never studied that particular architecture style with the five domes, um, but usually when we see four, it's the evangelists. Also, I've seen um, 
you know, domes that have the story of creation in them, that have a uh, story of revelation in them, and some ancient old churches in Greece yeah. and in the old world that have those as well. So I'm not particularly sure what those domes are dedicated for in that particular church. Um, there's, there's not really any, uh, I'm sure there are guidelines, but there's some freedom with that on what you are able to do or not to do, so. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm keeping you guys a little bit long today. Yes, John. When Christ was crucified, was he facing east? You know, I read, I read that, uh, I was, in my research, I read that the, one of the reasons why we face east is because Christ was crucified facing west. So that was like the side of darkness. That was the side of the evil. He was facing the evil face to face. And so the east is the side of the light. Um, that's not something I found in seminary. That was something I found in my research for my topic today. I didn't share it because I could not confirm it with any patristic sources. Um, but that is something I did find, and something that people will probably say is one of the reasons why we face the Eastern Church as well. Um, again, I didn't share it because I could not confirm it through any patristic texts or anything like that. So it's not... Uh, uh, nothing, that, nothing that I've found. Uh, we could do more research as well on that. There's another question. Yes. This is a little off the topic of the architecture, but are, are you going to be talking about the items on the yeah, table I'll soon, Yeah, very too? briefly on your way out, I'll have, I'll have you guys come up and look at these things. Um, I can run through really quickly. Because uh, I wanted to know that what is on top of the discari, what is that called? Yes, I'll, I can explain really quickly those things because I want to get you guys out of here, too. Well, we have, I brought a brochure so you could see one in person with a really good seal on it, so you can see all the different elements live in person. I have two gospel books to show the two different sides of the gospel. On the one side is the crucifixion. This is the side that we leave up during the week. And then on, the, on Sunday, we flip it over, and on the other side is an icon of the resurrection, because Sunday is always a celebration of the resurrection. So even in our gospel books, there's always symbolism. There's never, nothing's ever plain. So I'll leave these up here to show. This actually is an interesting um, thing that probably most people don't get to see. This is called the Andimension. You'll see it when you come up here. The Andimension is the, uh, it's placed on top of the altar table and we perform the sacrament on here. Uh, for the practical purpose is it catches the uh, crumbs that might fall from the discadion, but the theological purpose is it has the signature and the seal of the bishop on it. And so when the bishop is not present, it is a representation of his blessing that we can perform the liturgy uh, anywhere that this Andimension is. So on this Andimension, there's an icon of the, of the burial of Christ and the empty cross and the four evangelists with the mystical supper. So take a look at it. This is a very interesting piece. You probably won't get to see it very often. So take a, take a quick look at that as well. Here is the chalice uh, and the discadion. Now the discadion, again, is a representation of the church and of heaven. And on top of it is the, we call this the asterisk, the asterisko. And it is in the prayers, we, when we say it, we say the star, it, it, it's related to the star which goes over the cave in Bethlehem. St. Germanos, uh, who was a father in the 7th century, I believe, he wrote a patristic commentary on the liturgy and he related many of the acts that we do during the liturgy to the birth and the life of Christ. So when, the, when this is placed, it's the, the star was over the cave in Bethlehem. So it's, it represents the star uh, in Bethlehem as well. And it, the practical purpose, there's always a practical and a symbolic. The practical is it keeps the coverings off of the host, off of the, of the, of the, uh, of the bread, so that the crumbs don't get everywhere and get stuck to it. So that's the practical purpose and the symbolic purpose as well. This is the Yair. This goes over the gifts. It's the covering for the gifts. Uh, the priest picks it up at, during the creed and, and shakes it, uh, representing... Uh, again, practical purpose. In the old days of the church, they had a problem with um, bugs and flies. So when the priest shakes the, shakes the thing, he's shaking, literally shooing the flies away from the, the gifts. We don't have to worry about that too much anymore, but in the old days, it was a problem. The, this is a representation also of the, you can say, of the tomb being broken by Christ in the resurrection, by the Holy Spirit, the movement of the Holy Spirit shaking the, uh, shaking the, the ayat as well. And then these are the coverings for the for the gifts, uh, again, they're used to cover to protect the gifts from anything that might fall or any, uh, again, in the old days, any critters that might have tried to get into them. Um, they covered them to protect them. The lance is here. The priest uses this to pierce the amno, just like the, the soldier pierced the uh, side of Christ. And so we do that and we make a lot of the cuts with this, with the lance, we call it the spear. 
And then the spoon is here, which we use to give Holy Communion as well. So please, on your way out, please come take a look uh, at all these uh, wonderful things we have here. Oh, the censer is the only other thing. Uh, censor, the censer, interestingly enough, is usually shaped like a church. You can see the top is kind of like a dome of a church. And then um, the incense rises out of it, representing our prayers, which go up, up, into, up to heaven and up to God. So these are all the uh, liturgical the items. Say it again. Why do they have the bells? The bells are a symbol of joy. Uh, you know, they're, uh, usually there's 12 representing the 12 apostles. If we say the apostles, their voice has gone out into all the earth. So we make the noise just like the apostles received the good news and they went out and told everybody the good news of the resurrection of Christ to the whole world. So, so these are the symbolisms of the censor as well. This one? Oh, this is the Zeon holder, yes. This is just the Zeon holder. Uh, there's not, uh, it just carries the hot water from the hot water pitcher to the priest. And um, usually it matches the, the, the liturgical set to make a more a glorified uh, liturgy service. So. so yeah, I thought I'd bring it out because a lot of people don't get to see it if they're not in the altar. So. All right, any other, if there's no other questions, I invite you guys to come up, take as much time as you want to in inspect and uh, see these, these lovely items that we have here. Dine presvies aiki mi ton theo tokon, ke prostasies sa me tan Αφούς και νεκρώσεις φούν και κράτησεν Ως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωή μετέστησεν Ω μητρανικής σαν